Tonight I want to speak on the subject, Choose Joy. And I want you to think about that title because some people think that joy is something that someone else gives you. Sometimes they don't know how to receive joy or encounter joy. So one of the big questions that I want to answer tonight is where does joy come from? Now we obviously know that there's something called happiness that depends upon what? Happenings. Happiness depends upon happenings. So you can lose happiness real fast if something changes in your life. But joy does not come from happenings. Joy comes from a deeper place. It comes from a very spiritual place because it's a very, it is a spiritual gift. Remember the fruit of the Spirit, and I'm gonna go there in a moment. The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, what's the next one? Joy and peace. So when you understand that joy is a spiritual thing, that joy is a spiritual experience, sometimes we look differently at how how we receive joy and how we walk out joy in our life. So I wanna start with Romans chapter 14, verse 17. Romans chapter 14, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. I want you to say that with me. Joy in the Holy Spirit. How many of you know there's a difference in just joy and joy in the Holy Spirit? So let me hear everybody say it again. Joy in the Holy Spirit. Now you gotta get that in your spirit. You have to understand what does that mean to have joy in the Holy Spirit? Now on the day of Pentecost, one of the marks of the day of Pentecost was exceeding great joy. One of the reasons they were able to win so many people, anybody remember that number that got saved? By the end of the week, 8,000 people got saved. 3,000 in one place, 5,000 in another place. And the Bible says because there was great joy in the city. As a matter of fact, when revival broke out and Philip the evangelist was sent there, the Bible describes revival as great joy in the city. So on the day of Pentecost, we have this scene where not only were there cloven tongues of fire that came down upon each of them, not only was there, um, was there, I hear God talking outside. I know what's going on. Everybody's looking at that. Did you hear that? Yes, I heard it. I heard that. So that's okay. Edit that part out, guys. So there we go. We know it's thundering and lightning and storming all around us. But tonight we're here to talk about joy. Everybody say joy. All right, okay. So, so on the day of Pentecost, there is, this, there is this scene that breaks out on the streets of Jerusalem that can only be described as joy that overflowed from the upper room. Now listen to this passage, and I want you to think about this for a moment. Acts chapter two, verse 15. For these men, or these are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. That's nine o'clock in the morning. Now. When the world makes you drunk, when you get drunk on, on intoxicating liquors, you know what happens? You become silly and irresponsible. But that's not what spiritual joy looks like. Spiritual joy does not look like the same thing that drunk on liquor looks like. Drunk on liquor looks silly and irresponsible, but drunk in the Holy Spirit looks entirely different. Listen to this. This is not a staggering, silly group of people in the streets of Jerusalem with their eyes rolling around and they're staggering all over the place and people are holding them up. There's no way they could have won the city of Jerusalem like that. There's no way that anyone would have listened to them. It would have discounted the validity of this moment. But you know what happens? They're hearing these people speak in 15 different languages. They're hearing them speak in 15 different languages in an intelligible tongue. So they're seeing, so what are they talking about drunk as you suppose? You have to understand that this is a Jewish audience and he's speaking like Jewish people understand that when they go to a wedding feast, the people drink and they start dancing and joyful. And what I don't see on the day of Pentecost, I don't think this was on the day of Pentecost. I don't think it was eyes rolling around, people acting silly and saying crazy things. I think that's what the world looks like when they get drunk. I don't think that's what Christians look like when they get drunk in the spirit. 
I think when you get drunk in the spirit, there's a responsibility that goes with that. I think when you get drunk in the spirit, that there is a maturity that goes with that. I think when you get drunk in the spirit, there's a boldness that comes with that. When you get drunk in the spirit, they went into the streets fearlessly, courageously, and they started winning people to the Lord. You want to convince me you're drunk in the spirit? Then go witness to somebody and get them saved. That's what happens on the day of Pentecost. It wasn't just people, you know, just rolling around everywhere and rolling their eyes. That's not what drunk in the spirit even looks like. That's what drunk in the world looks like. Drunk in the spirit looks like boldness and joy. So think about this. On the day of Pentecost, all these people are in the street and they're dancing. If you've ever been to a Jewish event or a Jewish wedding or even to the Western Wall when there's a bar mitzvah or a wedding going on, you're gonna see the, you're gonna see hoopahs and you're gonna see the twirl dance and you're gonna see people dancing in circles and grabbing each other under the arm. It's kind of like what square dancing kind of looks like, you know, in the Southern culture. You're gonna see people wrapping their arms around each other and dancing. It's this joy. And what happens at the day of Pentecost is there's this exuberant, extreme joy that comes from the upper room and into the, into the spirit or into the streets, and people want that joy. They're thinking, I don't know what you're drinking, but I want that new wine. I don't know what you've just done, but that's what I want. I, I want to feel like that. I want that to be in my life. And from that one experience, it wasn't just the sermon that that caused 3,000 people to convert. It was the joy of that upper room that invaded the city because every time the Spirit falls in a city, the Bible says there is great joy in the city. And so the amazing thing is happening when these people are being drunk in the Holy Spirit. Now think about this. Who are some of the most joyous people you know? Stop and think about this. Now, it's easy for us to think about the people that pull us down, right? We've all got people like that in our life. It's like, I can only take you in spurts because you drag me down when I'm with you. Hopefully, you didn't have to spend Thanksgiving with that person. But if you did, we're glad you're here tonight. You chose the right night to show up because I'm talking about joy. So there's people in your life that they're always filled with problems. They're always pulling you down. Their whole life is one big drama. And it's like, listen, I love you. It doesn't doesn't mean I don't love you, but I just can't take you all the time. I can only take you part of the time because it's just, it's just, I don't have enough energy to pull it all back up all the time. It's like an uphill climb every time I'm around you. And so people like that, but, but think about the opposite. Think about the people in your life that are joyous. You know what that looks like? It's contagious. I mean, you can't wait to get around them. Do you have any friends that laugh a lot? Everybody needs friends. You know, we, we've had through different seasons of our life, it's like our friends have changed. But we used to have a, a couple that we went with everywhere. We went on vacation with them. I mean, we, we went out to eat with them every single week. And she laughed constantly. I'm telling you what, if the woman had her eyes open, she was laughing out loud. And we could, we loved being around them because it didn't matter what kind of day we were having. She was full of joy enough for all of us. As a matter of fact, we had to rein her in a few times because she was so full of joy. It was infectious. And when you have people full of the joy of the Lord, it is contagious. Their laughter is contagious. Their spirit is contagious. Their their demeanor is contagious, everything around them. Here's the thing you need to know. Satan does not want you to have joy. He wants you to be depressed. He wants you to feel sorry for yourself. He wants you to be needy. He wants you to drain everybody in your life with your problem. He want, that's what he wants out of you because he knows this. He knows that Nehemiah 8 and 10 says that the joy of the Lord is your strength. And he knows that if you ever get full of joy, you're gonna be a force to reckon with. If you ever get full of the joy of the Spirit, there is gonna be something for him to look out for. As long as you're dragging yourself around and dragging everybody around. The devil's not worried about you. I'm just being honest, honey. He's not worried about you. He knows you're not going to do much damage to his kingdom, but you let somebody get full of the joy of the Holy Ghost, and that is somebody the devil is terrified of because it's contagious. He knows that if somebody gets full of the Spirit and full of the, full of the joy of the Lord, that they are going to walk strong. 
People that have no joy walk weak. People that are full of joy walk strong. So you see this courage, you see this boldness that comes out from people that walk in the Spirit. Um, you know, joy changes the way you do everything. Joy, how many of you know that if you're in love, that's wonderful, but if you're in love and full of joy, that's incredible. There's a big difference in loving, you know, you tolerating somebody and actually loving to be around them. You know, there's some people married to somebody they love but they no longer like. And that's a hard place to be. Man, I love you, but I just don't like you anymore. You know, that's a hard place to be. But find somebody full of joy that says, man, you're my best friend. I can't wait. I know, listen, if I can't be with anybody else but you, we're gonna have a good time. You need friends like that. You need family like that in your life. And best of all, I wish that people, we had more people that could, that could exuberate Christianity that way. There is no problem witnessing in this world when we're full of joy. No problem at all. That's what won Jerusalem. That's what won Lystra. That's what won Philippi. That's what won Colossae. That's what won the New Testament churches as people full of joy and hope and boldness came into the streets and turned the world upside down. So my, my family came to the Lord whenever I was five years old. And I still remember my baptism at five years old. Now, keep in mind, I did not go to church before I was five. And so when my mom and dad came to the Lord and I was five, I was just entering, back in my day, it was kindergarten wasn't very, you know, wasn't, was, most people didn't go to kindergarten. A few people did. So I started in first grade, right? So I was like the year before first grade and Pastor Charles Clark was out witnessing and my Aunt Frances came to the Lord and my mom and dad came to the Lord and we ended up in the Smyrna Church of God in Smyrna, Georgia. Okay, so that's where we ended up. And here's what I remember as a kid. My mom and dad dragging me to this church and I didn't know anything about church. I didn't know what you're supposed to do in church, how you're supposed to act in church. But I'm telling you, I still remember this to this day. There was a man, and I even had to ask my dad later, what was that man's name? And my dad knew exactly who his name was. His last name was Ledbetter, okay? And I don't know anything about this man because I was a five-year-old, but what I knew is that they had a choir. And when this man sang, he stood right in the middle. He had white hair, and when he sang, he smiled so big when he sang and clapped his hands and I was sitting there as a five-year-old thinking, that's what I want. I don't know how to get that. I don't know where that comes from. I don't know where to go for that. If they put me, I don't know what that altar is about, but if that's where I gotta go to get that, that's where I'm going. I don't know what that Duncan tank up there, that Duncan booth looks like, you know, because I didn't know about baptism. I don't know why they're getting all these people in the water and getting them wet, but that's what I gotta do to get that. What I remember as a five-year-old, the thing that drew me, even as a little kid, to Christianity was the joy of Brother Ledbetter. Well, then we moved to Tennessee. I was born in Tennessee, and so we'd moved to Georgia, and we'd moved to Tennessee, and then we moved back to Georgia. I mean, that was my whole life, flip-flopping from state to state. So I lived in Georgia 10 years, and I've lived here uh, twice that long, okay, in Tennessee. So we moved to Tennessee, and we started, we moved to Greenville, Tennessee, where, where my family, where I was born, and most of my family was born, and started going to the Bridges Chapel Church of God, okay? My dad was just kind of starting in ministry, and I was still a little kid. By this time, I'm about seven or eight years old, and when I go into Bridges Chapel, it's a country, a country folks way out in the country, a country church, and the biggest man in the church, they, his name was George Dunn. Everybody called him Half Dunn. You've heard me talk about this guy, right? He was a great big man that wore bib overhauls, all right? Big, the, those big blue bib overhauls, great big guy. And he sat on the front row, and out of all the places I could sit, I didn't want to sit with the boys my age. I didn't want to sit with my brother or my sister. I didn't want to sit with my parents. I wanted to sit by half done. And as a eight-year-old kid, I always wanted to sit by that big man because of one thing. 
He looked like the happiest man in the world to me. I'm thinking, I don't know how to get that. I'll go to that altar over and over and over, but before my day is done, I will have that inside of me one way or another. When George done, now he was a great big man. I'm telling you, he was a big man, but he wasn't too big to shout. Now when he shouted, he shouted all over. He could do this and bounce for the next five minutes. I mean, it didn't take much for him to do the wave. He just had to kind of lean and he did the wave. I mean, because he was a happy man. And this guy would get up, and I remember he had, a, he had an unusual way of clapping. It's like his hands were way back here, and he would do this. And it was real as a big clap. You know, I'm used to seeing this thing, you know. He had this great big clap, and then he'd get the stone on his feet, and then he'd start jumping just like this. I've seen him run down the aisle and run around the church. And the t- I've told you before about us peeking out the window to see how far he'd get, and he jumped across the fence and about blew us our mind. Then he ran across the pond and didn't even know he was walking on water. And as a kid, it stained me. But you know what stained me more than him walking on water? His joy. I barely remember. I do remember, but I barely remember that one night. But what I will never forget is the joy of this man's life every single service. He came in smiling from ear to ear. He had the joy of the Lord in his heart. And as an eight-year-old kid, everybody kept saying, boy, Brian, one of these days you're gonna preach the gospel. And I kept saying, no, you know, you have no idea. I'm never gonna preach the gospel, but I am gonna be happy as him because whatever he has That's what I want. It was his joy that made me want to be a Christian when I barely understood Christianity. Now, they didn't have children's church in those days, so there was no such thing as going to children's church. Most of the time, you sat in front of your mama in the seat in front of you, and if you acted up, we all have scars. Everybody in my generation, we got scars right back here. You know what I mean? They grab the short hair and rip it right there if you ever acted up. So there was no such thing as paper airplanes in church. There was no such thing is bringing an iPad. That didn't exist, honey. You had to act like you liked it if you have no idea. They might be preaching on the anti-beast in Revelation, but as a kid, you go sit there and say, amen, yes, amen. If you didn't, your mama's hand would be right there in the short hair, and she would take her shot at you, buddy. That's, that's what growing up in church looked like for me. And so there was a part of that that I'm thinking, my goodness, I can't wait to get out of that. But you know what? I never wanted to leave I never wanted to leave church because it was the happiest place in the world to me. My wife would tell you that the happiest place, I mean, we both got ruined really early. Faith was the pianist at her little country church at eight years old the only piano player they had. She was playing the piano. She couldn't even reach the pedals. They set her up on songbooks or phone books. Now the phone book there was about that thick. On songbooks, they set her up on songbooks just so she could reach the keys. And she will tell you to this day that the happiest place in her whole life was church. She could not wait to get there. And it was all because of this one thing. The joy of the Lord was so prevalent in those rooms that we never wanted to leave the presence of God. So I'm gonna tell you four places where joy comes from, and I'm gonna try to get through this. Uh, I'm excited about this sermon, and so you can already tell, right? So I'm gonna tell you four places that joy comes from. Here's the first one. Joy is a spiritual response to those who've encountered God. Joy is a spiritual response for people who have just encountered the presence of God. Psalm 5 and 11 says, but let those rejoice who put their trust in you. Let them ever shout for joy because you defend them. Let those who love your name be joyful in you. Did you see that? How many times is the word joy in that one verse? Because he's telling you that The people who encounter God encounter the joy of the Lord. It's it's supposed to be that way. It's the joy of the Lord that gives you strength. It's the joy of the Lord that makes you strong. He says in Psalm 16 and 10, for you will not leave my soul in shield, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You show me the paths of life, and in your presence is what? The fullness of joy. Somebody say that for me. In your presence is what? 
fullness of joy. If I can just get in God's presence, something can happen there that can't happen any place else. Can I see the hand of somebody here tonight that would say, and somebody online that would say, I have had the worst days of my life, but I knew if I could just ever get back in the presence of God, that's all it would take. If I could just get in his presence, something would happen in the presence of the Lord that would fill me up again. I'm telling you, church has turned me around a thousand times in my life where I had to drag myself in and I danced my way all the way to the car because the joy of the Lord filled up my life so much. Psalm 32, many sorrows shall be in the wicked, but he, he who trusts the Lord, mercy shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteousness. And then look at this, and what? And shout and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. I want you to say that, shout for joy. I want you to say it again, shout for joy. One more time, say it again, shout for joy. And I want you to shout for joy, all of you, up and right, up, all of you upright in heart. Now, how many of you have lived long enough to know that words change their meaning? You can say the same thing. How many remember when bad meant bad and good meant good? And now somebody says, oh man, that's bad. And they don't mean it's bad, they mean it's good. Or somebody will say, that was just sick. Now when I grew up, sick meant you needed a doctor or you threw up or something. Sick now means that's awesome. I mean, so now that is just sick and that means it's off, awesome. How remember the world before the word same? Remember when we used to actually complete a sentence and now it's just same, which means I feel the same way about it as you feel. So words change their meaning through, through the ages. One of the words in church that has a new meaning is the word shout. Because when I grew up, now if I say, and I like this, there's nothing wrong with this, but if I say, shout unto God with the voice of triumph, you know what I hear now? Everybody, well, let, let's just try it, because you know exactly what to do. Every church in the world does this now. So let me hear you, shout unto God with the voice of triumph. That's what shout means now. It actually means to open your mouth and holler. Holler. Is that country? Holler? I hadn't gotten my y'all back, but I'm getting to other things back. It's coming back to me, all right? So why do you, holler? Is that the way, the way you say it? Yell. Let me just go with yell, all right? So, so nowadays when we say, shout unto God, we yell. Years ago, that's not what that meant. So Kathy, you know what it meant. In the old days, when a saint shouted, it wasn't a yell, it was a movement. It meant that I just felt the presence of God and my body is reacting to the presence of God. I've just encountered God's presence and sometimes it's like, the spirit was willing, but the flesh is weak, so you didn't know what they were gonna do. I mean, sometimes you had to get out of their way because when people got full of the Holy Spirit and joyous in the Lord, I mean, they shouted all kinds of ways. Uh, we had a little lady at our church, um, her name was Ellen Nell, and Sister Nell, even after she was in her 90s, she would come up, we'd have a prayer line, Sister Nell would come up, and I'd say, Sister Nell, what do you need from the Lord? And she'd say, oh, Pastor B, I don't need anything. I just need somebody to help me shout. I'm too old to shout by myself. All right, a couple of elders come over here, a couple of armor bears, and they'd all hold her up and let her shout. She'd just stand there and shout. I mean, she'd just go to town because she knew, and I asked you one time, Sister Nell, why do you do that? Oh, because the joy of the Lord is my strength. If I could just get in his presence, if I can just feel his presence, I can leave here stronger than I came in. I can leave here happier than I came in. I can leave here more, more sound mind than I came in if I can just get in his presence. When Faith and I first went to St. Louis, we were pastoring before it became the, you know, the mega church, Twin Rivers. It was the Webster Groves Church of God. And the Webster Groves Church of God was a lot different from Twin Rivers. It was a small little church, about 50 people. And one of those 50 people was a little lady by the name of Dorothy Butler. And the kids all had a name for her. All the kids and the teenagers in the church called her Buckin Butler. I almost said that when I preached her funeral, but I thought I better not. But I almost said, it's good to see you come out for Buckin Butler, because everybody in the church knew her as Buckin Butler. And there was a reason why they called her that. It's because when Sister Butler felt the presence of the Lord, she bucked. 
And I don't know how else to say it, but she would do just like this. She would buck just like this. And she, as she got older, she had to hold on to something. And it might be you, but she never stopped bucking until the day she bucked herself right on into glory. I'm telling she never stopped bucking. She bucked as long as she could move, she bucked. And she bucked herself right on into heaven because these old saints, you know what they call these old saints? Maud Glass. Here's another. This was Faith's grandmother. Little country church, Donaldsonville Church in Donaldsonville, South Georgia. Sister Maud Glass was a quiet lady. I mean, she didn't say much in a room. She never talked much. She was very, very quiet. This is Faith's mom's mother. And she had these two little, look like cinnamon rolls on the side of her head. She would take, she had long hair and she'd braid them and then make these little cinnamon roll looking things and put pins in them. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It's like she had two of them. You want to go by and just take a bite. You know, it looked that good. And she had them perfectly set on both sides of her head until the glory hit her. Now, when the glory of God would come in the room and she would encounter the presence of the Lord, you better move because those cinnamon rolls turned into weed eaters because she had start shaking that head. Now, she was an old lady and she couldn't get out and dance. Anymore. All of them danced when they could. And then when they couldn't dance, they just held on and bucked or whatever they did. So Sister Glass, Maud Glass, she would hold on to the pew in front of her and everybody knew to move because when that head got to moving those pins came out and you then you could you could see how long her hair was and it was really long and those two braids came out and she turned into a glorified weed eater and if you didn't move she would cut your hair whether you wanted to cut or not because sister Maud glass had felt a streak of glory and she was under the power of god that's what shouting was back in those days so we didn't know about yelling. Nobody ever said anything about yelling when you say the word shout. When you say, the, you know, shout with joy, that meant when the joy of the Lord comes on me, my body is going to respond in some way to exemplify that the joy of the Lord is upon me. Now, where does that come from? You know, they called that generation fanatics, but they also called them miracle workers. Because that same fanatic generation, they saw people healed and fevered brows fall. They saw broken bones healed. They saw people get up off their deathbed. Those same old fanatic saints could clear out a hospital room too because there was something about them that understood the glory and the presence of God in their life. And so the joy of the Lord was about encountering God's presence in some way that I'm having this reaction to this. Well, you may think, well, well, that was just a cultural thing. That was just something they learned. No, not really, because it's all through the Bible. And you know it very well. Every time you say the word hallelujah, you say it. The word hallel jah, hallel jehovah. Hallel means to celebrate Jehovah. That means God just touched me and I've got to celebrate. Now, some people celebrate beautifully and some people celebrate like a wounded water buffalo. You know, some people have this glorious dance. There was a man named Bob Snodderly. As a matter of fact, Bob Snodderly lived around here. Bob Snodderly had the prettiest dance. I mean, he could outdo Fred Astaire. When Bob Snodderly got under the spirit, he would skip across the room and clap his hands, and it was the most beautiful thing to watch. And then there was others out there. When the Holy Ghost got on them, it looked like both knees were broken and both legs were broken, but that's just all they could do to express this joy that was bubbling up inside of them. It's Hallel. They were expressing Hallel. Why do you think that the spirit of Michal, David's wife, the daughter of Saul, called him undignified? David was dancing in a way, he was celebrating God, not in a, not in a, a lewd way, he was celebrating God in a way that she thought was undignified for a king. Because I don't have time to go through these because this is a whole sermon right here of what I'm about to give you, but you need to go home and preach the sermon to yourself. Start in Psalm 146 and go all the way to Psalm 150. Those are called the Hallelujah Psalms. And the reason they're called the Hallelujah Psalms is because the translation, the translation starts every one of those Psalms with praise ye the Lord, but that's a translation. Look at the Hebrew. The, the Hebrew in every one of those Psalms is Hallel Jah. Hallel Jehovah. Celebrate Jehovah. So in Psalm 146, it 
opens up with hallelujah, it closes with hallelujah. Psalm 147 opens with hallelujah, it closes with hallelujah. Psalm 148 opens with hallelujah, it closes with hallelujah. And listen, you want some shoutings? You, be, you better put on your shouting shoes and your shouting music when you go through this. Because when you start reading all the reasons you shout, you will not be able to keep it to yourself when you realize that the stars are praising him and the mountains are praising him and the trees are praising him. And here you are in the glorified body. You have a body like God. You have a threefold, a triune being. You have the power of the Holy Spirit living in you. And you say, if a rock can cry out and a tree can cry out and a wave can clap their hands, surely there's got to be a praise inside of me to give to Almighty God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So David was one of those fanatics who got accused of overacting when the joy of the Lord came upon him. This past Thursday was Thanksgiving, and um, we went to my, well, we go to my sister's house. Now that we live back in the South, in St. Louis, we didn't get to do that. So my sister has three sons, and they have big families, lots of kids. So it was about 30 of us that got together down below Atlanta. And my, my nephew, Chris, his actual job is he is the head of Homeland Security for the state of Georgia, so that's his occupation. His wife, Stephanie, is the head of the Georgia State Patrol, so don't mess with her. She is the first woman to ever hold that post, so she's the lieutenant colonel of the Georgia State Patrol. So we were at their house, and they're kind of like the power team of Georgia, right? So we're in the house, and he's talking to me. They call me Uncle B. So we're, we're sitting around talking. He said, Uncle B, let me tell you a story. He said, back when I was driving Governor Kemp around, so Governor Kemp is the, Brian Kemp is the governor of the state of Georgia, and Chris used to be his driver when he was still in the state patrol before he became the uh, head of Homeland Security. And so he said, back when I was driving uh, Governor Kemp around, he said, he is one of the most spiritual men I've ever met that's in politics. He said, he's a Lutheran, and he said, he wanted to go by a Lutheran church all the time. He said, he wouldn't even and allow us to come in with him. He would say, nobody's going to bother me in here. He said he would go in the Lutheran church and he'd come down. You could see there was tears in his eyes where he'd been crying over the state, crying over the God to help him, a, a good Christian man. He said that Governor Kemp came to him one time and said, Chris, he said, you know, I'm Lutheran and my, my understanding of Georgia and, and church and is kind of limited. He said, I want to branch out. He said, how did you grow up? And Chris said, well, I grew up Pentecostal. He said, well, I want to go to a Pentecostal church. And Chris said, are you sure? He didn't know what that meant. He said, yeah, I want to go to a Pentecostal church. Next Sunday, you pick a Pentecostal church and take me there. So my nephew's telling me this story just a few days ago. So he said he picked out this church south of Atlanta. It has about 1,000 people. It's an African-American church. He said they got in there. He said they, they knew the governor was coming. They sit him on the front row. He said those old church mothers got to shouting and moving. He said the next thing you know, that music got to go. And he said these mothers would come by. they just they just run their shawls right by him, and they would dance all around. They knew the governor was there, so they were really dancing hard with the joy of the Lord as their strength. And he said, I didn't know what he was going to do. I didn't know if he wanted to leave early. This guy's a Lutheran. He said, I didn't know what he was going to say. And he said, I looked over. And he said he was weeping like a baby. He said he was standing there. He said, I've never seen anything like this. And he kept telling Chris, he looked over at Chris. He said, what's this I'm feeling? My skin is actually tingling. He said, what is this? I've never experienced anything like this. So the service was over. They welcomed the governor. And Chris said on the way home, he kept saying, I can't get it off of me. Whatever that was, I'm still feeling it in my skin. It's still in my arms. He said the next day, he goes back to the governor governor's house to drive him. The governor said, I don't know where you took me yesterday, but it's still in me. He said, I feel like it's in my back and in my, I mean, this is the governor of the state of Georgia, who's the present governor. He said, I feel like it's in my back. Chris said, he said, Uncle B, this went on for two weeks. He said, two weeks later after we'd been, he said, I still feel whatever we got in that church. He said, I still feel it on me. Can I tell you something? When you encounter God and the joy of the Lord, it's going to react differently in everybody. But one thing is for sure, you cannot keep it to yourself when you're in the presence of Almighty God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So, Joy comes from encountering the presence of God. And whether you're bucking, buckling, 
bucking, bucking butler or whether you're mauled glass and you've turned your, 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 uh, your cinnamon roll into a weed eater, regardless of who you are, when the presence of God comes over you, it changes you. Anybody ever experienced that? Raise your hand if you know exactly what I'm talking about. Say, Dr. B, I know exactly what you're talking about. The encountering the presence of the Lord brings joy, and joy brings strength. That's what changed Jerusalem. That's what changed. That's what early church revival looked like. That's what real revival looks like. Why do you think people were lined up at 7 a.m. in the morning to go to Brownsville Assembly of God when the service didn't start to 7 p.m. that night. Tell me how many churches you know that have a 12-hour waiting line to get in the building. There's people that were there. Some of you were there. People waited for 12 hours to go to church. Think about that. 12 hours to go to church. Why? Because something happened in that moment with God that still affects you. I promise you that the people that were in that revival or any revival you still have the residue of revival on you to this very day. You can hear a Brownsville song and the glory comes right back on you. You can, you can think about the goodness of the Lord and something changes. That's what the joy of the Lord does. Okay, I gotta move on. Here's the second one. Joy is also a response to those who have heard the good news of Jesus. Now, one of the things about the Christmas story, and we're in that season of year, you know, December starts in a couple of days, that one of the words that are often associated with Christmas is joy. And you know why? Because the word keeps repeating itself all through the Christmas story. Listen to this, Luke 2. For behold, I bring you good tidings of what? Great joy. Good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. And I like how different versions say that. One version says, good news of great joy. The New uh, Living Translation says, good news that will bring great joy to all people. That's the, that's the word that came from the angels when Jesus was born. When the Magi came and worshiped him, you know how that scene is described in that short little passage of the scripture? They left with exceeding great joy. There's something about encountering Jesus that leaves you with exceeding great joy. In the book of Luke, the, the book of Luke ends like this. The disciples in Bethany, they just saw the ascension of Jesus, and it says they walked away from the ascension of Jesus, and they were filled with great joy when they went into the city. There's something about encountering the power of God. There's something about encountering the good news of Jesus Christ that brings joy. Now, can I tell you, that we get very happy when somebody gets saved. That's why I can't wait till the 13th of December. I hope you will invite everybody you know. There are people that will never come and hear me preach, or anybody preach for that matter, but they'll come to a program like this. They'll come to that because they're gonna see the, the, the they're gonna hear the gospel message presented a different way. Listen to what Luke 15 and 10 says about that. There is joy in the presence of the angels of God over what? One sinner who repents. One sinner who repents. There is joy in the presence of, of, of the angels of God. Can you imagine the day you got saved, there was a party that broke out in heaven? Did you know that? Did you know that when you lead someone to the Lord, that, I wanna ask you a question. Don't answer me, just answer to yourself. When is the last time you actually witnessed to somebody? Now, it could have been today. So I'm not judging anyone. I'm just saying, when is the last time you shared your faith? And when is the last time you won someone to the Lord? When is the last time that you walked them all the way through to the sinner's prayer and you saw them? I'll tell you, if you've ever done that, there is something absolutely that changed you. I was in the Atlanta airport one time. I was flying, I don't know where I was going, but I was in the Atlanta airport and I was in a hurry. And I saw this guy, he had this other guy and he was preaching, this guy was preaching. I mean, he had that guy right there on the edge. And I walked up and all I said was, amen, brother. That's all I said. And he said, amen, brother. He said, come over here, I'm late for my plane. He's all yours, just like that. And I'm standing there in the south wing of the, of the, uh, of the, of the uh, luggage, about to get my luggage, and there's this guy about that far from saying yes to Jesus. That guy had to go grab a car that was waiting on him outside, and I'm sitting there thinking, okay, 
how do we finish this? And I said, what's the last thing he told you? And he told me, I said, oh, okay, I know where to go now. And listen, I, I talked to him and talked to him and that guy right there in the Atlanta airport, I didn't even have a chance to get his name, but right there in the Atlanta airport, there was a party that broke out in heaven because this guy, he had found the person of peace and this guy accepted Jesus Christ in the Atlanta airport. Listen, you can win somebody in the grocery store. You can win somebody at a restaurant. I cannot tell you how many people I've won to the Lord in a restaurant over and over. Not just me, but faith. I can't tell you about faith winning a girl to the, to the Lord in a mall one time. The Lord said, you need to go to that kiosk and witness to that girl. And faith did what we all do. She chickened out. But this was a round mall, you know. And faith kept, she got under conviction. Now, when the redhead would rather pray than shop, you know God is moving. He is moving. Now, she prays all the time, to be honest with you. She's one of the greatest prayer words I know. But in this mall, we went there on a, you know, the shop. Every store, she was so miserable. Brian, I just, I, and here, this is the reason I knew it was God because she would usually say, Brian, I think you need to go witness that girl. But she didn't say that. She said, I think God wants me to witness to that girl. And we got all the way around that mall. And she finally said to me, if that girl is still there, I am going to go over there and witness to her myself. And that girl was still there. And I saw the redhead hand me the, hand me the bags. And she went over there. And all she said to her was, honey, I know you don't know me, but I feel like I'm supposed to pray for you. That's all she said. That's all it took because God had already seasoned her. She was ready for it. That girl came out of that the back of that kiosk crying like a baby, hugged Faith like she had known her her whole life. They stood there and hugged and cried for two hours, not two hours, about 10 minutes, hugged and cried for about 10 minutes, and she gave her heart to Jesus Christ right there in a shopping mall because somebody said... The Holy Spirit said, I'm, she's ready, will you go? Something happens when you win somebody to the Lord, but it doesn't just happen here. There's something ecstatic about that, but in heaven, a party breaks out. Okay, the third reason, okay, now, there's gonna be a few people that are gonna get offended at this one. But I just wanna tell you, I didn't write it, I'm just reading it, okay? If I wrote it, yeah. But if I'm gonna preach on joy, I gotta tell you the truth. So, Joy also comes when you guard your mind from self-centeredness. Self-centered people have a very difficult time having joy. As a matter of fact, it's almost impossible. Self-centered people are always needy. They're always looking for something. They're always skeptical. They're always having a hard time believing the good things are going to happen. If you're self-centered, you have a very difficult time having joy. And you show me self-centered people that are full of joy, and I'll show you it's a temporary thing. It might last a day or so, but it won't. They're not a joyous person most of the time. Okay, so where do you get that from, Dr. B? I'm so glad you asked because the Bible tells us this answer. Now, the book of Philippians, the book of Philippians is only four chapters long. The word joy or rejoice or something that refers to joy is in those four chapters 18 times. The word mind is in those four chapters 17 times. And the book of Philippians is really about, now keep in mind that the apostle Paul was in prison when he wrote it. But this is where he writes, I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. This is where he writes that. So in this prison cell, he writes the book of joy and he says the secret to joy is guarding your mind from self-centeredness. He said if you guard your mind, he tells you this over and over and over. When you read Philippians, you're going to hear him say this over and over. So he mentions, let me just read one part. This is chapter 2, verse 2. Fulfill my joy... And be like-minded, having the same love, being of one mind and of one accord. Let nothing be done out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, esteem others better than himself. Let, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also the interests of others. How many of you see where he's going with that? He's saying if you want joy, it can't always be about you and your need. If you want joy, it can't always be about what you don't have because here's the thing that I know and Paul knew, you're a bottomless pit. God can give you everything you've asked for and a week later you can be depressed. You can come, you can have the, one of the greatest dreams of your life fulfilled and you can't hold on to that joy for a week 
because of self-centeredness. That's what he's talking about here. So it's, it doesn't matter what God does for you. You're, you. It's like until you get rid of that, you'll never be filled up. Nobody can fill you up enough. The people around you can say, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. Pat you, pat you, pat you. Good, 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 good. You love, 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 love. And it's never enough. It's never enough. There's something inside of you that always needs just one more compliment, one more affirmation, one more person to tell you how good you are, one more person. And the issue is not that you're not blessed. The issue is that you're so focused on yourself that you can't be focused on other people and you're blocking the joy of the Lord from your life because everything in your mind is about you. And you can't have joy because of that. Listen to, what he, listen to what he continues to say. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say what? See, he just keeps saying it over and over and over. I heard somebody write this down one time. Or I heard somebody say this and I wrote it down. He said, if you want joy for an hour, take a good nap. If you want joy, <laughs> I heard a few amens that time. If you want joy for a year, inherit lots of money. All right? That's only for a year. If you want joy for a lifetime, put others first and don't spend so much time focusing on yourself. If you want joy for a lifetime. When I, when I heard that, I wrote that down. You want, jo you want to live a joyous life, don't focus on yourself and your deficits all the time. Not only is it killing you, it's killing everybody that loves you because they can never give you enough. And I know you don't want to say amen, but if you know I'm telling the truth, somebody say amen. amen. So here's what Philippians says about that. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's any praiseworthy, what? Meditate on these things. Fill your mind with good thoughts so that the joy of the Lord can fill you. Fill your mind, fill your relationships with healthy people so the joy of the Lord can fill you up. You cannot fill your mind with constant thoughts about you and expect to have room for the joy of the Lord to cause you, because the joy of the Lord will make you serve. The joy of the Lord will make you love. The joy of the Lord will cause, will cause an eruption of laughter and a contagious about your life to fill your life. And when you're focused on yourself and your lack, you can't see that. All right, so we're almost, that's a hit and run. We're not gonna spend much time there. The rest of that's written in the book of Philippians, four chapters, read it. 18 times joy, 17 times mind. Keep your mind guarded and keep your self-centeredness uh, at, at distance. Put others before yourself so that the joy of the Lord can be in your life. All right, here's the last one. The joy of the Lord is an anointing that comes from the Holy Spirit. It's an anointing that comes from the Holy Spirit, all right? So Isaiah 61 says, and you've heard this verse probably many times in your life, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. Everybody say anointed me. Okay, now notice this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me and the Lord has anointed me to preach good things could tidings to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of God, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort those who are mourned. Now, you can break all this down. All this is about the anointing, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, and here's the next one, and the oil of what for mourning? Oil of joy for mourning. Notice these things right here coupled together. Beauty for ashes, oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness that they may be called the trees of righteousness. How many of you want to hang out with a tree of righteousness? Yeah, I, I want to call. I love this person because they're just so full of life. I love to hang around this person because they're so full of fruit. That's what it's mean. It doesn't mean that you're just that. It means that's how everyone sees you. I want to be around this person. They just make me happy to be with them. They're so full of joy. They're so full of fruit. There's so many good things happening in their life. I just want to be, this is a fruit of righteousness. This is that person. How many of you want to be like that, right? You want to be like, God, make me like that. So when you understand that you can be anointed by the Holy Spirit to be joyous, Notice that the Holy Spirit also makes you fruitful. And the second fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace. So it's the fruit of the Spirit. So notice that 
if I encounter God, I receive the joy of the Lord. If I hear the good news about Jesus, I, hear, I encounter the joy of the Lord. If I keep myself from self-centeredness and think and meditate on good things, I will encounter the joy of the Lord or if I allow the Holy Spirit to just fill me with the joy of the Lord, I can have it that way. N listen to what Romans 15 and 13 says, and I'm coming to a close here. I want the musicians, you guys, come on out and get ready to sing Romans 15 and 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. What is this? Look at this. Fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the Holy Spirit, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and that's a powerful verse. That's a, that's a powerful verse. Fill you with joy and peace in believing. It's one thing for him to do it. It's another thing for you to believe it. Now li listen to what I'm saying. These guys are getting ready, but I want you to listen to what I'm saying. It's one thing for the Holy Spirit to do it, but you gotta believe it. You gotta believe you're full of joy. You gotta believe you are blessed. You've gotta believe that God is doing great things in your life. Psalm 27 and six, listen to this. And then I'm gonna close with an illustration and then we're gonna pray. And now my head shall be lifted above my enemies all around me. Therefore, therefore I will offer the sacrifices of joy. Look at this. Now I'm not gonna sing this song either, but I'm gonna reference it. How many of you grew up in church where they used to sing, we bring the sacrifice of praise into the house? Of the Lord? I, I still love that song, by the way. But we used to sing that. And every time I would hear that song, it reminded me that I don't have to feel good to praise God. It reminded me that sometimes that the Lord sees my sacrifice of praise. And so notice this. He says, we will offer sacrifices of joy. Now this is very important. We will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. Yes, I will sing. Yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Sometimes you have to sing your way out. So I'm gonna close with a story and Braden, you can come on out, bud. And all, all the guys who are about to sing. But I'm gonna close with this story. A few years ago when I was passionate to Twin I was just going through a very difficult time, a very dark time. There we go. You guys can come on and get behind me. Just come on behind me. Braden, Braden, come on out, bud. A few years ago, we were at Twin Rivers, and I was just going through a very difficult time. You know, as a pastor, you have those seasons. And this was just one of those seasons. It doesn't matter what was going on. It was just hard. It was just difficult. It was hard. And our youth group were doing these things that back in the day we called human videos. You might remember the human videos. So they would have a song. We, we, see, we see Chosen doing things like that now. All right. So, so um, they would sing a song and they would kind of do a dance routine to it. And I honestly didn't know this song very well, but I remembered the youth group singing it. And so I was in the house all by myself. Faith was gone that day. The kids were gone that day. And I was in the house all by myself. And I remember saying this, God, you've got to help me. I, I need an angel. I need something. But you've got to help me. I am pulling myself up by the bootstraps. I feel like I'm pulling a freight train up a hill. I, I need your help. I, I, just, I just need some energy. I need some strength. But, but what's happening right now in me is not working. And I need something to work because I just need that to happen. And I remember that song. And I remembered a sermon that there was an old preacher by the name of Ray Hughes preached years ago. Probably very few of you have ever heard his name before. But Ray Hughes preached a sermon at a camp meeting, and the title of his sermon was Hallelujah. And he preached those Hallelujah Psalms I was just telling you about. He started in Psalm 140, 146 and preached all the way through 150. And by the time he finished that song, the whole place was up in smoke. I mean, you can't preach the Hallelujah Psalms without that happening. The whole place was lit up. Now, I remember one thing he said. He said that even the cornfield praises God. I remember him saying that. He said that when you, he said sometimes you gotta go in a room and lock yourself in the room with the devil and one of you has to leave. 
you got to lock yourself in the room. You've been carrying around with you all day long anyway. Lock yourself in a room with the devil and tell him, listen, I'm not listening to you anymore, but you're about to listen to me. He said, sometimes you got to remember that in the valley, that God's wind will blow down through the valley and in the lowest place on the earth, the corn will start praising him. I'd never thought about corn praising God, but he talked about the corn field in that valley and how the wind of God would blow and the rustling of those corn shucks and the rustling of those corn stalks. And he said, if you just listen on a windy day when God passes by, you can hear the corn field praising God in the valley. And when I remembered that sermon that that old preacher had preached, I thought, God, that's where I'm at. I am in the valley and I'm going to shut myself up in a room with a devil and one of us is going to leave. Either he's going to leave before I do or I'm going to leave before he does. If I leave before he does, that he still got me and he's still going to talk to me and he's still going to beat me up. But if he leaves before I do, I'm going to leave here with the victory of God in my heart and his voice will be silent and the joy of the Lord will be my strength. And I chose this song. I didn't even know it, but I looked it up. Kurt Carr was doing the song at the time. And I'm going to quote the verses to this song. I'm going to just quote it for you. It says, the presence of the Lord is here. The presence of the Lord is here. I can feel it in the atmosphere. The presence of the Lord is here. The presence of the Lord is here. The presence of the Lord is here. I can feel it in the atmosphere because the presence of the Lord is here. Can't you see him working on the outside? But I can feel him moving on the inside. So come and enter in and cast your cares on him. He'll open up the windows, pour out a blessing because when the Lord steps in, he brings everything you need, healing, power, victory. Say it, I say it's up to you, whatever you need him to do. Just trust him and believe him, and by faith you will receive him, for I can feel the presence of the Lord, and I'm gonna get my blessing somehow. I can feel the presence of the Lord, and I'm gonna get my blessing right now. He said, and then he went into a time, and to another part of the song that says, it's time, it's my my time for God's favor. It's my time to be blessed. And I thought, listen, I don't know this song very well, but that's what I need. I need Brother Let Better singing in the choir. I need Half Done jumping on the front row. I need Ma Glass slinging her head around. I need Sister Nell knowing that the joy of the Lord will give you strength. I need something like they had. I may be a fanatic, but I'd rather be a happy fanatic than a sad, depressed person without joy. You can call me what you want to call me, but I've learned a long time ago that the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And can I tell you, I got in a room with the devil and one of us left, but it wasn't me. It wasn't me. I stayed there longer than he did and I danced my way back to victory. I shouted my way back to victory. I shouted my way back into the presence of the Lord. I, I, I didn't know they were going to sing this. I just told Braden how I was going to end my sermon. And I said, this is an old song. He said, you know what? If I get the right band, we might just be able to pull it off. So here, and I don't know if they're going to pull it off or not, but I'm telling you, I know this. The presence of the Lord is here. The presence of the Lord is here. I can feel it in the atmosphere. And the presence of the Lord is here. I can see him working on the outside, but I can feel him moving on the inside. Come and enter in and cast your cares on him. That's what I know. And what I know is if you will do tonight what I did, there can be joy in your valley. There can be joy in your sorrow. He'll turn your morning into dancing. So here's what we're gonna do tonight. I'm not gonna lay hands on anybody. I'm not gonna ask for the prayer team to come, but I'm gonna ask everybody that will to come and stand around the front. Everybody that will, just come on right now. Everybody that will, just come and stand around the front. Everybody that will, just come and stand around the front. 
There are some things, hear me tonight, there are some things I can't do for you. Oh, if I could do it, I would. If I could dance your dance, you know I like to dance. I would dance for you. If I could shout your shout, and you know I like to shout, I would shout for you. But you know what? I can't dance for you. And I can't shout for you. And I can't give you joy. Only the Holy Spirit can give you joy. I can't give you joy. Only an encounter with God can give you joy. I can't give you joy, but the presence of the Lord can bring you joy. An encounter with God can bring you joy. They're gonna sing this song and I'm gonna tell you, shut yourself in a room in the next few minutes with the devil until one of you leave. It's either gonna be you or it's gonna be him. But if you want your joy, you make him leave before you leave and you'll walk out of here tonight with the joy of the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We bless you, Lord.